Well, good morning. It uh, looks like we can all breathe a sigh of relief to some degree at least, because if we are here in person or by live stream, that means that we survived 2020, that we made it to 2021 against all, all the odds. Uh, as Stephen was praying a minute ago, it was, it was filled with surprises, a lot of hardships, things that I don't think anyone predicted or could have predicted. Um, but God brought us through it, and, and that's cause for celebration. So I hope that everyone had a, a good New Year. Uh, if you don't celebrate New Year's, that's not your thing, it's not your bag, so to say. Uh, we, I, I'm sure we can at least agree that it, it's cause to be thankful. It's cause to be thankful to God that He provided for us, that He kept us uh, throughout last year. Um, that being said, uh, let me say something else that everybody already knows, but, but let me just put my finger on it. Uh, despite the claims of multiple motivational memes on social media that talk about the magic of a new calendar year, um, last year's problems didn't exactly disappear just because the clock struck midnight again uh, a few nights ago. There's still social unrest across the country, profound political and moral disagreements dividing the nation. There's still a virus creating various forms of lockdowns and all the depression and suicide and addictions that that facilitates. There's still countless people without jobs. Many Americans are, are concerned about what they perceive to be rushed vaccines. Some other people are a little happy about the potential zombie apocalypse that might mean for us. But... There's, uh, there's also worries now for a few weeks about a new strain of the virus that's supposed to be uh, far more contagious, and it's reached a, a few of the states here in America, according to recent news. And worse than all of that, we still have to wear a mask every time we go out in public. That reaches the top for me. Um, but, but all of this is, is still so because regardless of a new year, this is still a, a fallen world, and sin is still sin. Our shortcomings are still our shortcomings. There's still a spiritual war that's being raged for our souls, for our hearts, for our minds. All of these things are, are still here, and so we have to, to continue to think soberly about them. But having said that, uh, to put right up alongside that, it's also true that God is still God and that the gospel is still the gospel and that absolutely everything is under His control. And because of that, because of that, that means that our hope is still secure. Regardless of what happened in 2020, and regardless of what may or may not happen in 2021, that's not going to change either because of the new year. But again, life has been exceptionally difficult for many of us. Not, not all of us made it through last year unscathed. Um, and in light of the continuing difficulties from last year, it, it seemed, seemed good to uh, begin this year with an exhortation to make every effort to keep first things first in our lives. And so our, our passage this morning is one that deals with just that. It deals with keeping first things first. It deals with foundations, and it, it focuses on what matters most in life as we look at the potentials of 2021 together. And, and what I mean by, well, when I say foundational things, it, I only have two very basic but cornerstone points for the Christian life that I'm going to be hammering away at over these next few minutes. And these are the two points. The kingdom of God is the most valuable thing in life, and the character of God is the most beautiful thing in life. The kingdom of God is the most valuable thing in life, and the character of God is the most beautiful thing in life. So I'd invite everyone, if you brought your Bibles, turn with me to uh, the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be reading verses 31 to 33. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 to 33. It reads as follows. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? 
Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And that verse 33 is going to be our our main focus here. Seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, this passage is roughly three-fourths of the way or so into what's called the Sermon on the Mount, a very famous sermon by Jesus, no doubt. Many people here are familiar with it. And it's my conviction, this is a big claim, but, but it's my conviction that what we just read, that it captures the primary purpose or aim of the entire Sermon on the Mount. Holding it together is one coherent message, giving the various points and the various arguments throughout the sermon meaning and weight. Or to use a, a common metaphor, I think the, the sentiment and the, and the principles in our passage, I think they're the hinge upon which the whole sermon swings. And so because of that, for this, and for the sake of context as well, um, we'll be frequently reaching outside of our text this morning into the, the broader scope of the Sermon on the Mount in order to gain a, a more full and accurate meaning of our passage. So it might feel at times this morning like what we're doing is something of a uh, particularized survey of the Sermon on the Mount, and that's because it parts, it, it, it kind of is that, it parts. Um, if you're not familiar with the sermon, though, that there's no, no worries there. I, I think I've uh, outlined this in a way where, where you'll be able to understand all the points regardless. So I want to do three things with the text this morning to get at those two points I mentioned earlier. Number one, uh, I want to consider the importance of seeking first the kingdom of God, and that's where, the, that's where the majority of this sermon is going to be. That's where the bulk of our time and focus is going to land is on that. And then in light of what we see there, second, I want to discuss what it means to then seek God's righteousness first, because if you notice that they're paired together in the text. And then really briefly at the end, uh, I'll just say a few words about God's promise to us to provide all that we truly need in life when we sacrifice in pursuit of those two things. So, Lord willing, that that this will serve as a good reminder, as a a good challenge for all of us in in the new year. So, that's the roadmap for what we're doing this morning. So, part one, the importance of seeking the kingdom of God first. If I were asked what the dominant principle in our passage is, what we just read, I would say it's that we, unlike those who don't know God, Gentiles is what they're called in the passage, that we who do know God, that we would value that which is most valuable in life so as to spend our lives in pursuit of that which is most worthy of our pursuit, no matter the cost. I'll say that again. The dominant principle in our passage, I think, is that unlike those who don't know God, that we Christians would would value that which is most valuable in life so as to spend our lives in pursuit of that which is most worthy of our pursuit, regardless of what it costs us. Or as our, our passage words it, that we above all other perceived needs like food and drink and clothing, that we would seek first the kingdom of God. Not that we wouldn't seek the other things at all, but that we would seek first the kingdom of God. Now think with me for a minute on this. What must be the reigning presupposition that Jesus holds to? in order to give a command so broad and so breathtaking as, above all perceived needs for life, seek the kingdom first. What's the dominating conviction of Jesus behind that kind of a command? And when when I think about it, wouldn't it have to be something like The kingdom of God is the most valuable treasure to be had in all of life, period. 
Wouldn't that have to be the reigning conviction in the heart and the mind of Jesus in order to give us that command? Because by giving that command, if you think about it, Jesus is necessarily also making the staggering claim that the kingdom of God is the most glorious treasure in the universe, or else he wouldn't tell us to seek it first above everything else, no matter the cost. And we find this presupposition, it's it's popping up all over the Sermon on the Mount from the very beginning to the very end. We see it in the very first sentence of the Sermon on the Mount. In chapter 5, verse 3, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, the basis of being blessed in that passage is that you will definitely receive the kingdom of heaven. It's as good as yours. That's what I think the present tense means there, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's it's dealing with, with present certainty, not present possession but present certainty of something to come. And that's why the the, the following Beatitudes, which are so famous, they immediately turn to the future tense as they hold forth the promises of the kingdom to us. Blessed are you, for you shall be comforted. You shall inherit the earth. You shall be satisfied. You shall receive mercy. You shall see God. You shall be called the sons of God or daughters of God. And thus from the very beginning, the sermon as a whole is always looking forward and it's always calling us to consider the future outcome of our lives. It's always calling us to consider the kingdom of heaven as the most worthy thing to pursue in life. So consider this this brief survey with, with me, if you will. I'll go in order of the sermon. If you're familiar with it, you, you'll recognize the, the order. Why all these teachings after the Beatitudes? Why all these teachings on righteous living? Why? Because, verse 20 of chapter 5, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's why. It's, it's about gaining the kingdom. Why should I be concerned, Jesus, about murder or unjust anger in my heart? Verse 22, I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to the judgment, and whoever says to his brother, you fool, will be liable to hellfire. That is, you'll lose the kingdom. That's why. You'll get the the alternative of the kingdom. Why should I care about adultery and unlawful divorce and the, the dangers of harboring willful lust in my heart? Why should I be willing, as Jesus says, to metaphorically cut off my arm or pluck out my eye in order to prevent myself from those kinds of things? Verses 29 and 30, it's better that you lose some of your members than that your whole body be cast into hell. That is, you will lose the kingdom. You'll enter hell rather than heaven. Why should I be concerned about loving my enemies rather than just loving my friends? Why should that be a concern for me? Because, verse 46 of chapter 5, if you only love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even Gentiles do the same? That is, like a Gentile, you will fail to gain the heavenly reward. That's why. Similarly, why should I care about not being hypocritical or self-seeking in my charity and in my fasting in pursuit of God? Verses 4 and 13 in chapter 6. Jesus says, so that our giving and fasting may be genuine, so that we will get reward from the Father. How am I to pray, Jesus? You're to pray like this, verses 9 through 10 of chapter 6. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is, You're to pray for the hastening of the kingdom of heaven and all that that means for the world when it gets here. Why should I be concerned about forgiving those who hurt me or sin against me? Why should I have a forgiving heart? Verse 15 of chapter 6. Because if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. That is, you'll die in your sins which ultimately matters most because it means you'll lose the kingdom. 
What should I be laying up or storing up during my time here on earth, Jesus? Verse 20 of chapter 6. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Why should I make sure that that I check the gate I've entered in life or or the path that I'm on in my attempts to enter the kingdom? Why should I do that? Because, verse 14 of chapter 7, the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. That is, you want to make sure that you're on the right path in life because you don't want to lose the kingdom like the majority of people in this world have and will. And you want to pay attention to your heart and and, and your your way of life because you don't want to be deceived into thinking that you're a Christian just because you profess Christ, that you're truly saved. Verse 21 of chapter 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. So be careful, Jesus concludes within the sermon, because you don't want to be the foolish person who built your life on sand instead of on the rock and consequently lost everything when the storm came, verses 26 and 27 of chapter 7. In other words, you don't want to lose the reward of the kingdom of heaven on the day of judgment. This sermon is, in my estimation, unarguably, top to bottom, front to back, predicated on a belief in the superior value and worthiness of the kingdom of heaven compared to absolutely everything in this life. And thus, back in our passage, verse 33 of chapter 6, we're called to seek first the kingdom, to pursue, or another way to translate it, to passionately chase after the kingdom of heaven above all things. Jesus believed, he believes with unshakable confidence that gaining the kingdom of heaven is the greatest of all goals all aims, and all ambitions in this life, and that everything else is counted as nothing in comparison. And because that's the the great presupposition of Jesus here, the great assumption of Jesus is that the audience hearing this or reading this, that they believe it too. That you and I believe that along with him. Since virtually every command and every encouragement, every motivation in the sermon is based upon the belief that the reward of heaven is superior to anything else in life, because that's the case, the sermon doesn't logically work if Jesus doesn't believe this, and it's rendered ineffective or powerless on our hearts if we don't believe it too. Think about it. Jesus says to us in the Beatitudes, verse 4, chapter 5, I know that you're mourning right now. I know that you're hurting. But the comfort of the kingdom of heaven is coming and it's yours. And when we hear that, we can feel it, whether we say it out loud, whether we admit it, even to ourselves, we feel it. I'm hurting right now, though. I'd rather have comfort right now. And that might mean that I'm going to seek it elsewhere where I ought not because waiting who knows how many years from now for the kingdom to come, this kingdom that you talk about, it feels unhelpful right now. And thus the exhortation is rendered virtually ineffective. Jesus says in Verses 10 to 12 in chapter 5. If you endure persecution for my name, you will get the kingdom of heaven, just like the prophets who were before you. So endure persecution with expectant joy. But I'm not joyful right now. Being safe and accepted and not hated or gossiped about seems far better at the moment than the promise of the kingdom. Not losing my job or my friends or my family even, or depending on where you live in the world, being beaten or killed. Not having that happen seems a whole lot better right now than the promise of a future kingdom, and thus ineffective on the heart. 
a really common one. Jesus says, overcome sexual lust and temptations to things like pornography and sexual promiscuity and adultery. Because if you do, if you'll do that, you'll get the kingdom. But clicking the website looks a whole lot more inviting right now especially in light of my day, in light of my year, in my, in my life right now, temporarily satisfying this craving and this emptiness inside with that person over there seems far more gratifying than the kingdom. Besides, it's all covered under grace, right, Jesus? Ineffective on the heart. Or in our passage this morning, Make your aim and ambition in life the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And don't pursue worldly comforts or prioritize physical necessities like Gentiles do over the kingdom. Seek the kingdom first. You'll have it. But I've got a house payment. And I've got a career. I've got a family that you gave me, by the way, God. I've got a family to provide for, kids to send to college, retirement to prepare for. It's too risky not to keep all of that stuff first and foremost at all times, so I can't go there with you. Not if it means risking any of that. It's too hazardous. I have needs now. Command's ineffective. Since the great assumption of Jesus is that the reward of the kingdom is greater than anything this world has to offer. And everything in the Sermon on the Mount is based on that. Then in order for the sermon to be effective, the great question you have to ask yourself and I have to ask myself is, do you truly believe that? In the core of your being, is that true of you? Do you believe that the kingdom is is far more valuable, far more glorious, far more worthy of your love and your pursuit than anything that this world could ever possibly offer you? Do you actually really believe that? Because if we don't believe that, we'll never be able to do what this passage says. We won't be able to seek the kingdom of God first above all else, regardless of the danger, because there is danger involved. We won't be able to do it regardless of the sacrifice, because there will be a need for sacrifice. We won't be able to do it regardless of the anxiety, because it causes worry to live like this. We won't be able to seek the kingdom first if it hasn't been made up in our minds already and established firmly in our hearts that the reward of the kingdom of God, that it's everything to us, with zero things coming even close to second. Is that true of you? And if you're being honest with yourself, then you're probably like me, and the answer is, Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Not always. Not even the majority of the time. So let me try to do something here to help all of us make it more true for us. Um, Consider with me for a moment here what, what you could call the implicit beauty of the kingdom of heaven according to the Sermon on the Mount. And all those things that we just went over in that survey a minute ago, starting with the Beatitudes, I'm going to go in order, just just listen and ponder on the implied glories of the kingdom of God that's offered to us and secured for us in Christ. Think about this. The kingdom of heaven is a place where all false pride is absent. And people live in a state of genuine humility of spirit. It's a place in which all mourning and sorrow will be absent because all that could ever cause mourning and sorrow is absent. A place in which all will live in the comfort of God. 
It's a place that will envelop and renew and beautify the entire earth. It'll be a place of true righteousness and goodness and uprightness. It'll be a place permeated by the grace and mercy of God over those who are called His children. A place where God Himself will be seen and enjoyed and treasured in the person of Jesus. It'll be a place of peace, filled with those who only ever seek for and promote peace. It'll be absent of all suffering and persecution and hardship. A place where the truth of the gospel reigns unhindered, unchallenged in the hearts and minds and lives of absolutely everyone. It'll be a kingdom of salt and light. A kingdom that redounds in every activity and interaction to the glory of God who will live with us as our Father. It'll be a place where there's no murder or anger or bitterness or malice or gossip or slander or hate. It'll be a place absent of all false, enslaving lusts that lead people to unspeakable betrayals. Mark it down, there will be no betrayals in the kingdom of heaven. Instead, it'll be a place of purity, a place of perfect devotion and honesty and love toward neighbor. In fact, it'll be a place of such honesty that there's no need for exceptional vows or promises because everyone can be trusted to do and to be what they say they will do and be. It'll be a place absent of the desire and need for any sort of retaliation or vengeance, a place without enemies, a place filled with those who choose love over hate, blessing over cursing, always helping over getting even in any instance of disagreement or confusion. A place permeated with the perfection and completeness of God's own holy character. A place without poverty, but nevertheless a place of exquisite generosity and giving. A place where love for God and devotion to God is always genuine because it's a place where everyone is finally enabled to love God with all of their heart. An existence that never ends with cities and rewards that never decay. A place without anxiety or worry about survival or daily provisions. A place free of hypocrisy and unwarranted judgmentalness. A place where every individual treats one another as they themselves wish to be treated. A place where all the promises and beauty of the law and prophets is finally fulfilled and experienced. A place free of all deception and deceivers, free of all false teaching and false teachers, a place where only truth reigns in all its fullness and in all its freedom. That's the kingdom of heaven as it's necessarily implied to be by the Sermon on the Mount. That's the prize that Jesus holds out to us that that undergirds the sermon, that undergirds our text this morning. And as I was looking at all this, it's what could ever possibly compare to something like that? What, what could ever possibly compare to that kind of reward or gift that's offered to us by Christ? There's nothing that I could think of at all whatsoever that I could ever accurately or honestly put next to that and say, I think that's better. I think that's more worthy of my pursuit and my life. But we do that basically every day. We do it every morning when we wake up and the first thought and action isn't to pray, as the Sermon on the Mount says, my Father who's in heaven, hallowed be your name, bring the kingdom of heaven today. If not in full, bring it into my life a little more than it was yesterday. Keep me, protect me, preserve me, forgive me that I might have you and be with you forever in the kingdom that is to come. And the fact that that isn't our our first impulse, the fact that it isn't our first desire, every morning that reveals something about us that we're not oriented right. We're not orienting our day right or our year right. Instead, our first thought is the pursuit of something like social media or fitness Or if you're less ambitious like me, coffee. 
or for many of us, it's the first thing on our minds are the, the burdens and responsibilities that just make us wish we were still asleep. It's no wonder, it's no wonder that we don't pursue the kingdom first as often as we ought to. Because we're not good at keeping first things first. We're not good at it. 2020 didn't help with that. Now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to create some kind of law here that says every morning you've got to get up and you've got to say the Lord's Prayer or you're sinning. That's not what I'm doing. Well, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to highlight a principle, a reality about us. That one of the reasons that we fail to pursue the kingdom first is because we don't long for it as we ought to. And we don't long for it as we ought to because we don't love it and value it as we ought to. And that's often because we don't meditate on it as we ought to. We don't think about it enough. We don't pray for it enough. As Pastor Bryant was talking some about last week, we don't encourage each other with it enough as a church. And in our fallenness, we are easily distracted. We are easily tempted to foolishly view other things as more, value, more valuable because they promise instant or at least seemingly a more tangible gratification than a future kingdom that we can't see. Being right in front of us, earthly treasures are so alluring and deceptive. They are blinding and they, they play on our fallen desires because we so want the money and the car and the house and the toys. We want the ease and the comfort and the ability to be worry-free in this life. We so want to have certain friends and to be accepted into certain groups. We so long for respect and praise and admiration from those around us. We long to be gifted and special and to stand out. We long to be like those that we idolize. We long for immediate love and security. We long to be successful and to feel presently satisfied and whole. Now, obviously, obviously not all of these things, when they're placed in a certain context or in their, I don't know what you would call it, their base, their base forms, they're not necessarily wrong, but, but one of the ways they become wrong is when we prioritize gaining them first rather than the kingdom. And in so doing... It's an important point. In so doing, we actually rob ourselves. We rob ourselves of the truest sense of security and peace and acceptance that we could ever have in this life. By doing that, we rob ourselves of the very thing that we want. Because it comes from a knowledge of the glory of the kingdom. It comes from the promise of Christ himself that it's ours. That no matter what happens, it's ours already. That's, that, that's where our source of security and joy comes from in this life. That's why we're told to make it our chief aim for our good. Along with the pursuit of righteousness. Which brings us to the next part. What it means to seek God's righteousness first along with seeking the kingdom first. So going back to our text in verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We're not just to prioritize the, the reward of God's kingdom above all things, but the gaining of God's righteousness above everything. Let me, let me begin with, with one clarification here, because this, this subject gets sticky really, really fast. The Sermon on the Mount, which is the context for our passage, is not presenting us with a works-based salvation. Nor is it demanding some kind of perfection from us, even though it can seem that way to so many people when you read it with all of its moral imperatives. The sermon was written to and for average Christians, you might say. The Christian who's, who's working through the difficulties and fears of this life, the tragedies of this life, stumbling, making mistakes along the way, but, but leaning on God's grace for survival. 
It's written for those, according to the sermon, who know their proneness to sin and their proneness to be tempted and to be led astray. And so they're instructed to pray to God, forgive me of my trespasses. Lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from evil and from the evil one. As we've already seen also, it's written for the Christian who's in constant need of being reminded about the kingdom. Don't forget the kingdom. Value the kingdom. Don't forget its glory. Choose righteousness. Choose choose the glory of the kingdom over and over and over. It's written for the kind of Christian that needs that in their life, which in my experience is the vast majority of all Christians, including myself. So the Sermon on the Mount, it's not about perfectionism or a works-based righteousness. So, so what, what are all the, the, the moral commands to righteous works about? I would argue this, that they're about pursuing the heart and character of the kingdom because you love it and so wish to possess it. The works that it prescribes are less about earning something and more about aligning yourself with something that you perceive to be beautiful already and desirous. I want to be like the people who are going to be in the kingdom. I want to imbibe the glory and the ethos that characterizes my eternal home. My eternal reward, where all the saints of God will be, where angels are going to roam, where God himself is going to be in the person of Christ, reigning in holy and righteous majesty. That's where where I want to be because I'm in love with that heavenly vision. And because I'm in love with it, it's not only where I want to be, it's also what I want to be like. The character and the quality of that vision becomes the ambition of my life. That's the call here, generally speaking. It's not only a call to love that which is most lovely, but from the impetus of that love, it's a call to then seek and pursue that which is most worthy of seeking and pursuing. Not, Not seeing this, not understanding this connection between love of righteousness and pursuit of righteousness is where Countless people stumble in understanding the Christian faith and balancing the command to righteous works with grace. And because they stumble here, they also fail to make the next vital connection, the next step in the chain, which is not only does a failure to pursue righteousness reveal a lack of love for righteousness, but a lack of love for righteousness necessarily reveals a lack of love for God. Notice in our passage, it doesn't say that we are to prioritize righteousness in general above all else. It says we're to prioritize God's righteousness specifically. There's so many other places in the Bible to go to to prove this point. But in other words, the, the command to pursue God's righteousness first is itself a command to recognize the moral beauty of God himself. It's his character that we're called to want even more than our passage says, food or drink or clothing. To hate righteousness, therefore, is to hate God. To spurn righteousness is to spurn God. Or to pursue other things over righteousness is to consider other things more valuable or significant than God. That's why Jesus also famously says in this sermon that you can look at someone's works and know their position or status before God. He says you can know what kind of tree a person is based on their character, based on what kind of fruit they mainly and predominantly produce in their life because it reveals what they truly believe and what they truly value in life. It reveals their heart. Everything that we read a moment ago concerning the the beauty of the kingdom of heaven as it's implied to be in the Sermon on the Mount, all of it, it's only true of heaven because it's true of God first. It's God's presence and righteousness that makes heaven 
heaven. And if you remove God, it necessarily ceases to be heaven altogether. Everything that was so attractive about the kingdom of God from a moment ago, if you take that, transpose it onto God as the source of it all, then you'll have a pretty good image in your mind of who your God is. And he's beautiful. He's glorious. He's perfect. He's absolutely perfect. You can say it like this. It's it's the spectacular character of the king that rules over his kingdom, which then makes the kingdom so spectacular. His moral purity and perfection filling up and, and permeating his kingdom, making it pure and perfect, just like himself. So that in a very real way, to love the holy, righteous kingdom is to love the holy, righteous God who reigns over the kingdom, making it all that it is. And therefore, to seek the kingdom of God is very much intertwined with seeking the righteousness of God. In some ways, it's even confluent. That's why some commentators, they, they, don't, they don't want to force too much of a distinction between seeking the kingdom of God and seeking the righteousness of God. There are distinctions. There are distinctions that are good to make. But in many ways, to do one is to do the other. And so throughout the Sermon on the Mount, seeking entrance into the kingdom is always intimately connected with seeking to live out the righteousness of God in your life. But in both cases, with his righteousness and with his kingdom, the call to pursue them in both cases is about seeing surpassing beauty and being moved by that beauty to a certain type of lifestyle. Being moved by the beauty that you see to reorient your value system. That's why we're to seek them together. First, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Which leaves us now with the promise at the end of the passage that if we do this, God will provide all things that we need in this life. The passage says again, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And the all things, that we've already said it a few times now, they're the, the things mentioned earlier in the passage, the things that we need like food and water and clothing. And they, they serve in the passage as stand-ins for the necessities of life and that which we perceive to be the necessities of life. There's, there's a lot that could be said on this, but given the time, let, let, me, let me just use... This final point is more of, a, more of a closer. Skip ahead a little bit here. If 2020 has taught us anything, it's that anything can happen. When we're least expecting it, chaos or tragedy can strike seemingly out of nowhere and it can change everything. And it can last longer than we expected it to. And it can be more difficult than we ever expected it to. So before we need New Year's resolutions that are geared towards things like getting in better shape or improving our golf swings or whatever else, and just as a parenthesis, there's nothing wrong with New Year's resolutions. They're often a very good thing for us. Nothing wrong with them at all. But before we need those things, we need to get back to the basics. We need to make sure that we have first things first in our lives. We need to make sure that the, the reward of the kingdom of heaven and the beauty of God's righteousness, that they're first in our hearts. We need to meditate on them and invest in them and pray to God to make the truth of them come alive inside of us for them to become an anchor in our souls and a source of joy and contentment regardless of what's happening around us because who knows what could be around the corner waiting for us in 2021. I'm not in the slightest bit claiming to be a prophet, but I have a sneaky suspicion that this year, at least in some ways, 
is going to be more difficult than 2020. That's another conversation, though. But whether it is or it isn't, whether it is or it isn't, what we need more than other resolutions is a desire and a plan to make the kingdom of God and his righteousness the focal point of our lives. And if we do that, yes, it will cost us some things. It may cost us friends this year. It may cost us family. It may cost us reputation. It may even cost us a job or a promotion. It'll definitely cost us certain forms of entertainment. It may cost us certain perceived comforts and satisfactions. It may cost us certain immediate gratifications. It may create hardships and difficulties as we sacrifice for something greater, something eternal. But there's two certainties in all of that, two certainties offered to us here if we're willing to do it nonetheless. First one's this. In many ways, it won't be nearly as hard as you think it might be. Because you'll be captured at that moment. You'll be captured by a superior beauty and or wrapped up in this pursuit of a superior glory. And you'll find in that, you will find in that a, a mysterious satisfaction and joy that can carry you through all of it. And second... According to our passage, no matter what you have to give up in pursuing the kingdom of God and his righteousness, no matter what you fear losing or not getting, you have this promise from Christ himself that God will make sure that everything you truly need to make it safely to the reward will be given to you. Everything. He will withhold from you nothing that you need to receive the kingdom. Nothing. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, for seeing us through the hardships of this past year. Thank you for your provisions. Thank you for the ways you are helping us and protecting us and even using the difficulties around us to perfect us in ways that we, ways that we didn't perceive. We ask for this grace to follow us now into this new year. We ask for you to help us to see what's most valuable in life and that, that you would help us to keep those things first in our hearts. God, we, we lean on the promise of Christ that as we sacrifice in pursuit of you and in pursuit of your kingdom, that you will provide for us everything that we truly need. So God, would you, would you let this promise encourage us and would you let it empower us to seek you first above everything else this year? It's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.